Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Felix, for sharing your pulpit and your, your gift and your teaching and your training. He is my spiritual father. I just told Pastor Vernon in the back that I almost ran up here and wrestled him down and snatched that mic on trouble in my way because that's my song. All right? <laughs> Amen. Yes, hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, to all the mothers in the house. Happy Mother's Day to my spiritual mother. Happy Mother's Day. It's funny, my spiritual mother and father, I'm older than they are. <laughs> but amen, I still give them honor, right? And all honor to all the mothers in the house. I just want my Aunt Charlene to wave. Aunt Charlene, amen. Yes, she was, she was, a, she was, uh, she helped to raise us when we were little. And, and she had 10 kids, three sets of twins. All right? Yeah, we can learn a lot from her. Amen? And, and my mom had three, and, and we'd come together all the time, and, and, and we'd hang out and spend the night with each other and, and, and sneak out. And yeah, remember, remember, remember when you used to let me drive your car, Charlene? We was really sneaking out to the club. But amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes. And so um, this, was, this was kind of a tough day for those of us that don't have our mothers. Amen. And so I, ho I told Pastor, I hope I don't be up there crying the whole time. But I just wanted to honor my mom because she did teach me a, a, a few things. She's been gone about two years. Next month will make two years. And one thing I thought about my mother that she taught me is how to care for people. She always cared for people and the, and the underdog. And she was the first community group leader that I, that I met because she opened her home and allowed people to come stay with us. Uh, there was many times where my sister and I would have to give up our room for somebody else, but we never got mad about it. We were happy to have people. So, so she taught me how to, to care. And, and the next thing was that she she, would, she taught me how to hold my head up in the midst of adversity. See, my mom was, was active and vital, and she could party, and she could do all that. And then at the, the latter part of her life, she became disabled because of degenerative disc disease. And she would walk around on her walker, but she always had her held, head held high like the boss lady that she was because she was the boss. Amen. Yeah, she was the boss. And so I honor her. And on today, what we're going to do is look in the word at a woman, at a mother who had a lot of attributes that we could probably relate to. This woman, she didn't have a name. They just called her the Shunammite woman, possibly because she was from the town of Shunam. Amen. I, I forgot to pray, so I'm going to have to pray. Father God, I, I thank you. I honor you. I bless you, and I lift you up, Lord. I pray, God, that you speak and you move Karen out of the way, Lord. I pray, God, that your word will come forth, Lord, and that a mother or anyone here, Lord, will, will be able to uh, go forth, God, after today and know that you are the Jehovah Shalom of their lives. In your mighty son Jesus' name, amen. Man. So this Shunammite woman, she didn't have a name. She was from a town called Shunam, thus the Shunammite. And, and some things about her, she was, she was a Jewish lady. She was wealthy. Uh, she could apparently throw down in the kitchen because uh, there was a prophet that's also in this story called uh, Elisha, not to be mistaken by with Elijah, but Elisha, and he would pass through the town and she'd invite him over to eat. And I can imagine she could throw down in the kitchen. And so she was very hospitable. 
And in one occasion at the dinner table, she, she was very observant and had a discerning spirit because she noticed that this prophet was a holy man of God. So she went to her husband and asked him if they could build a room on their house so that the, when, the guy, when the prophet would pass through, he'd have somewhere to stay. So she was hospitable, observant, and discerning. And, and then she was loving, as we'll see later on, and then we'll also see that she was relentless and persistent, and she was a strong woman. I kind of thought, no offense, but I was like, this got to be a black woman. No offense to anyone. Amen. And so uh, she was unnamed, I believe, purposely, because there's a lot of information in this text that the author gives us. So I think he purposely did not name her because I believe that she's a part of you and, and, and she's a part of me and we can see ourselves in her mothers. And so I got to tell you a little bit about the prophet Elijah. In the Old Testament, prophets were the only way, the only way that God spoke through. He spoke through the prophet. So if you needed a word, you had to go to the prophet. Amen. So, so Elisha was going around from place to place prophesying. He was healing. He was advising kings. He was moving around doing what he did, his profiting services. And he, uh, uh, Old Testament prophet acts as a, as a mouthpiece. And we also know them to be the God representative in the earth realm. And that's important. That's important. And we'll see that later on. And so this Shunammite woman had built a room for this man of God. And one thing he noticed, he wanted to do something for her because of her hospitality. And so he inquired and, and she, you know, like I said, she was rich. And so she really didn't feel that she needed anything. You know, she had everything in, in, in the eyes of the, the world, it seems. Well, the prophet's servant observed that she didn't have any children. And so he said, well, I think she needs a son. Well, historically and culturally, a son is a blessing because a son carries on the name. At that time, there wasn't no 401k, there wasn't no social security, there wasn't no nursing homes, there wasn't any assisted living places. So the son provided for the aging parents. So to have a son would be a blessing. So the man of God called her to the room and, 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 and told her that within a year, you're going to have a son. And she said, now, nah, don't you lie to me. Don't get my hopes up. Because probably deep down inside, there was something that was missing in her life. But she ended up, you know, hallelujah, praise God. In a year's time, she had the son, you know, and, and, and we could say amen and go home. But there was a problem, and here's the problem. After a few years, that same miraculous son, and I neglected to say that they were old when they had him, he died. He died. So that's the problem that she encountered. So here's what she did. She began to pursue after this man of God. I believe she wanted to know what's going on. You promised him to me. What, what's happening, God? What's your plan? What's your purpose? What's going on in my life? So she pursued after Elisha. She found him. She brought him back to her home. And praise the Lord, he resurrected the son and brought him back to life. Amen. And we can probably have the benediction just right there. I mean, we had the music, we had the, we had the dancers, and, and we see this woman was, went through a situation, and then she was blessed, and we can probably go home, but there's a few things that I want to pull from this passage that I believe we can learn from, mothers. Amen. Are you here to learn something? Are you here to grab something to take with you, to hide in your heart? Because, you know, mothers, we have, a, I, I, we have a hard time. We carry a lot, amen? So we need to see what the Lord is 
saying here today. So 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. We're just going to look at stuff. I, I, I gave you the story, so, so we're just going to pull out some things. Let's go back and, and, and look at this Shunammite woman's problem. Her son died. The son that was given to her, the miracle, he died. Come down to verse 18. <clears throat> I'm reading from the ESV. It says, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. Yeah, we take it all, don't we, y'all? I had to pause there. Yeah, we carry a lot, mothers. Amen. <laughs> take him to his mama. And when he had lifted, brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, these words that ring in my spirit, all is well. <laughs> all is well. So what's interesting to me is this, is that her son dies and she don't even tell her husband. So let's look a little bit at the culture. During that time when a person dies, they would bury them right away, sometimes even on the same day, basically because of the climate. Leaving someone out in the heat could cause decaying. Also, in that culture, they would begin the mourning process. They would intentionally mourn for a period. Now, I believe Topaz is probably going to look upside my head, but I'm sure there's still some of us. We don't take the time. We don't, we don't intentionally mourn. Some of us are still grieving year after year. But in that culture, maybe for religious purposes, for whatever, they take the time. And, and you, you know, we, we read about it. They, they put on sackcloth and tear their robes. They take the time to mourn. And so she didn't bury him. She didn't mourn. She didn't tell her husband. What did she do? She took the child, not to his room, not to her room, but to the prophet's room and lays them on the bed. Well, you remember I said the Old Testament prophets were the, were the God representative in the earth realm. So I believe that was a place where God dwells. So she took him to the place where God dwells and she laid him on the bed. And here's what she did next. She walked away, closed the door, called her husband, and didn't say, baby, our baby's gone. She said, baby, give me a donkey and a servant. Now, now the city of Shunem was probably about 15 miles from where she finds Elisha. So the, the, they say it took about five or six hours. So she takes her child. Can I, can I get my first point on the screen? She takes her child to the place where God dwells. She lays him on the bed. She, she closes the door and walks away. You see, despite of our own desires or our own wants, because I'm sure she wanted to cry out, we must learn to take our problems before the Lord and guess what? Leave them there and guess what? Be good with it. Be
be good with it. Because see, when her, her husband said, what's going on? It, it's not the Sabbath. It, it's not a time to not work. This is a work day, honey. It, it's not the new moon, which was a festival. And, and why are you going to see the prophet? She said, all is well. All is well. See, we have to be good with it. We're, now, we sometimes do take our problems, and, and we do take them to the Lord. And maybe we leave them there, but the, but the text says she shut the door. And see, I don't think she shut the door because she didn't, she didn't want to deal with it anymore. I think she shut the door to keep herself from going back in to take her problem back out. Isn't that what we do? Mothers, isn't that what we do? I'm giving it to the Lord, but then five minutes later, I'm taking it back. Hallelujah. So she shut the door. Hallelujah. And left her problem at the feet of the Lord. Her son dies. All is well, all is well, all is well. We got to look at that for a moment. That three-word phrase basically in the Hebrew means shalom. We all know what shalom means. Peace. Peace. Not only peace, but it, it, it means to be sound, healthy, complete, perfect. It signifies a sense of well-being and harmony both within and without Tranquility, prosperity, rest, harmony. It's the absence of agitation or discord. It's a state of calmness, get this, without anxiety or stress. The idea behind the word shalom is wholeness and, and harmony, but in relationship with God. Mothers, you know how we do. We walk around with our all is well mask on, don't we? All is well. We're carrying the, the, the weight of the world on our shoulders, the weight of the family on our shoulders, the problems that our husbands are, are, are encountering, our children are encountering, our workplace, our, our church. We carry a whole lot of weight, and then we get up in the morning, and we take our shower and put on our makeup and fix our hair as if all is well, as if all is well. We put on that mask. We put on that mask and we walk around as if nothing is wrong, but something's wrong. Something is wrong. We carry that way. Uh, our motherly instincts, our passions, our love seems to override whatever God is trying to do. You see, God is trying to do something in our pro within the things that we go through. He has a plan and he has a purpose. But we allow our own, our own passions to override what God is doing. And so despite that, despite our desires, despite our wants, we must learn to take our problems, leave them there, Close the door and then be good with it for real. Have that peace within. And so let's see, what did the Shunammite woman do next? Well, she lost her son and she didn't tell her husband about it. And so uh, she got on her, that donkey, and she began to ride. She told, a ser she told the servant, don't stop or slow down unless I tell you to. She was pursuing after the God in her life. She was going after Jesus. Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the, when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with your child? And she answered, all is well. Amen. And when she came to the mountain, 
to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet and Gehazi came to push her away. But when the man of God, but then the man of God said, leave her alone for she is in bitter distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. Then lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. In other words, she told the man of God, I ain't going nowhere without you. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. And, and, and what was interesting about these verses, is, at, at least in this translation, was uh, if you go home and read it, the author just kept saying, man of God, man of God, man of God, man of God, when he was referring to Elisha. But then when he said Elisha's name, and this is probably another sermon, it was when Elisha was doing something out of order, I believe. He began to evoke Gehazi. But I digress. That's another sermon. Okay, Pastor. <laughs> so she pursues and she finds this man of God. And, and remember, the Old Testament prophets are the God representative in the earth realm at that time. She was pressing her way to God. She didn't tell her husband her son was dead. She didn't tell the servant, Gehazi, and technically she didn't tell Elisha. He knew something was wrong. My husband and I had this wrestle yesterday about this passage because I believed in my spirit that, that she went to him, perhaps not to have him resurrect her son, but to confirm the plan and the will of God. But that's just me. Because I believe Elisha did know that there was something not right with her son. So she reaches, she reaches Elisha. And the first thing she did was she grabbed his feet. She grabbed his feet. And, and, and some say that was an a, a act of respect. But then why would the servant try to push her away? Elisha said, leave her alone because she's in bitter distress. She's in bitter distress, mothers. She's in bitter distress. He said, the Lord has hidden it from me and hasn't told me. And so then he begins to dispatch Geh Gehazi, which I believe he was out of order because I believe she was coming to see Jesus. She was coming to face the Lord with her problem. So I need my second yeah, despite our own desires or wants, we must learn to pursue the Lord for our plans and our problems. The Lord, only the Lord, not Gehazi. And, and I'm sorry, Patrick, but not husband, but God. Only he can let me know what's going on, what's really going on. It says she was in dire despair. Or, or distress about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, I flew out to Phoenix, Arizona, and I found and learned that my son was diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer at the age of 31. Yeah, I was in bitter distress. It, it, it shook me. It, it caught me off guard. And I remember trying to put on that all is well mask in front of him and, and, and going to my hotel room and crying my eyes out all by myself. And then I'd come back to the hospital and I'd put on my all is well mask, but all wasn't well. I came back to Denver and I went to work with my all is well mask on and I came to church church all is well and I and I'd go home and climb up in my bed and I wouldn't clean my house I was not well I was distressed bitterly I was hurt it rocked my world it caught me off guard no one could say anything to me at all that could ease that pain isn't that mothers 
how we sometimes live our lives, whatever the problem might be. You know what it is that has brought you to your bitter distress. You know what it is. And you know how we do. We carry it. Huh. But despite our desires and our wants, because if I could, I'd carry that tumor in my rectum. I would have it taken out and I'd go through all the things he's gone through for the last two years for him. I would do that. But that was not the plan of God. Amen. So despite what I want, despite what you want, we have to learn to pursue God for his purpose and his plan. Amen. Hallelujah. And so she went and she only wanted to see God. And she grabbed the, the prophet and she told him, I ain't leaving here until you come back with me. Nobody knew her baby was dead, but her and the Lord. And so Elisha came and he said he arose and he followed her. So the servant went ahead, ran ahead of them. He got to the house. He went to the room. He did what Elisha told him to. He laid the staff on the baby's face. Nothing happened. He came back. He met them, and he told Elisha, this child's not waking up. And so here's where we come to our next point, beginning at verse 32. It says, I'm going to read it first, and then I'll read the point. It said, when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in, and now he's going to shut the door. He shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself upon him. The flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up. And again, walked once back and forth in the house and, and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. Yeah. In our pursuit of God's plans, we got to get along with God. We got to get alone with him. And so as we read this passage, what we see is that the focus shifts from the, the Shunammite to Elisha, and we can still learn from him. He, he gets to the room, and he sees the child laying there, and so he goes in, and he shuts the door just between him and the child. And so that Hebrew word for shut, it means to shut. It means to close or to close up. That same word was used in uh, Genesis when, the, when uh, the Lord shut up the door to the ark. That same word was also used when, when another mother by the name of Hannah was barren and it said the Lord shut up her womb. And so what I gathered from this shutting up in this case, is that, is that God is in control. God's in control of all things, right? And sometimes we have to shut things out and shut things in to be alone with God. So, so, so uh, God is in control. And not only is he, he in control, he is the God over life and death. When he shut up Hannah's, Hannah's womb, she couldn't have any children, and then later he opened it up, and she was able to give a life. So he's the God of, of, of life. He's the God of all things. He's the God in control. So, he, so Elisha goes in the room, just him and the child, and he shuts the door behind him. Sometimes we got to get alone with the Lord. Nobody else can say or help us. We have to shut out 
the outside voices. We have to shut out the outside world and noises and, and distractions and advice and what you should do and how you should do it. We got to shut all of that out. So mothers, as, as, as we go through our problems, we have to learn this. We got to give them to the Lord and, and leave them there and then be good with leaving it there and then pursue after God to see what is his will, his purpose, and his way for us. Then we got to get in our room and shut the door. Matthew 6 and 6 says it like this. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He got alone with God, and he began to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Now, if you walked in the room and seen a man laying on top of your child, you might have something to say. I don't know. I'm just saying. So he closed the door. He closed the outside because sometimes God has us do things that are unorthodox, and people don't get it. He laid on top of the child and began to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And then he walked around. The child's body became warm. And he walked around a little bit, I'm sure, praying and seeking. And he came back and he gave the son mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And then the son began to come alive. He began to sneeze. And he said, oh, go call his mama because he's back. You see, the Lord will reward openly. So she had a problem. She did something about it. And here's her resolution. Her son is resurrected. So there's one more verse. Verse 37. She came, and look at the order, and fell at his feet bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. <laughs> Can I get the next point? In our pursuit of God's plan and purpose, guess what? We begin to obtain all is well. We begin to obtain peace. Hallelujah. She began, her resolution for her problem was her son being resurrected. But see, this is what we have to understand and grasp, mothers, is that that was a temporary problem and a temporary resolution. See, what God is offering us is eternal. He's offering us his life, himself, for he is eternal. And he's offering us eternal life. And he's offering us his peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. So whether your problem is, has a different result, maybe your son or your daughter wasn't revived. Maybe they did die. Maybe that child got sentenced to jail and maybe they did go to jail. Maybe they are hooked on drugs. Maybe they don't talk to you anymore. Maybe their life is not what you want it to be. But you can have peace in the midst. In the midst of it all, God provides us with the all is well, the peace. The lady said, I didn't know my own strength. I'm sure the Shunammite didn't know her own strength. Let's pull up the last screen, which is my big idea. My big idea says, in spite of our own desires, we must learn to pursue after God's plans and purpose so we can obtain peace. All is well, ladies. All is well. All is well, ladies. All is well, mothers. All is well, fathers. We can obtain peace 
in the midst of it all. We don't always understand it, but God wants us to give it over to him and get to know him, get into relationship so he can reveal to us his purpose, his plan, his will. And even if it doesn't turn out the way we want it to, we can still have peace. The song said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows row, whatever my lot, whatever my problem, whatever my situation, whatever my circumstance, whatever I'm going through, hallelujah, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, hallelujah, all is well. 